Isaiah, the 46th chapter, verses 9 through 11. Shout glory when you get there. The word says, remember the things that I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. We're continuing the series that we have begun on God is in control. We're dealing with his sovereignty, human responsibility, and divine providence. I say again, his sovereignty, human responsibility, and divine providence. Now, I think we all must admit, at least to some degree, that we live in the midst of some chaos right now in this world. With everything going on with COVID-19 and all the things surrounding it, the uncertainty, the social distancing, the unemployment, the sickness that's taking place throughout the country, almost 100,000 deaths, and uh, and everything that's surrounding this pandemic, we have to stay resolute and understand and know beyond any doubt that our God, he is in control. Now, one might be inclined to ask, where is God in all of this mess that we're in? Now, I share with you, our God is in control, but some people may have that question in their hearts may still have that question in their minds, where is God in all of this? Because we think that if God is in it, then everything should be just fine. It should be okay. But how many know in this world, you will have trouble? But don't be afraid, he says, I've already overcome the world. And so we take consolation in that, knowing that God has already overcome the world through his son, Jesus Christ. And we have to know that as believers and professors of faith in the most high God, we must be convinced and know that our God is in control and be unwavering in that belief. The belief that God is in control for the Christian is hinged upon three prim uh, premises, three theological premises and principles. God's sovereignty human responsibility, and divine providence. Now, we talked about the first two in detail, and for the sake of review, I'm going to go through those a little bit again, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time on divine providence. Y'all ready? Amen. Amen. So we said with, before, and we shared with you that God's sovereignty, the sovereignty of God is the Christian teaching that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. God is sovereign Lord. By incontestable right, as the creator of all, he is the owner and the possessor of both heaven and earth. Sovereignty is an attribute of God based upon the premise that God, as the creator of heaven and earth, has absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he desires. The Bible says in Psalms, the 24th division, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalms 95 says this, for the Lord is great. He is a great God, a great king above all gods. And in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. The sea is his. And he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Psalms also says that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And so we have to know that he made everything and we belong to him. Somebody say, I belong to God. 
You see, the study of the sovereignty of God is a difficult truth for some people to understand. It's hard to grasp how God can be in control and how people can still have legitimate choices, not fake choices, but legitimate choices, meaning that they can choose which direction they want to go, their purpose. They, they, can, they can pervert it. They can go around it. They can do whatever they choose to do. God can call them to do one thing, and they can go another direction. God can send them to Nineveh, and they can go to Joppa. Amen. And so we know that men can make decisions, but we thank God that even as Jonah, God has a way of working it together for our good. Can the church say amen? amen. And so we have to understand that God's sovereignty and human responsibility are both true. Not just one, but both are true. They both coexist, running parallel together. And sometimes they never seem to meet, but we know and we share with you before that in hindsight they do. And that's why we're going to talk about divine providence a little bit today. But let me explain a little bit more about this human responsibility for the sake of reviewing for those that may not have heard the teaching before that I want to share that God, he's sovereign. Yes, he's in control. Everything is under his control, but he's not controlling everything. Everything is under his power, but he's not dictating every single thing that happens. When it comes to human responsibility, God sovereignly chose to self-limit his power by delegating authority to mankind in the Garden of Eden. And we know and we share with you how that he said, Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and everything that creepeth upon the earth. He told him, he says, I want you to dominate it. I want you to subdue it. I want you to conquer it. I want you to replenish the earth. Adam, I want you to do it on earth like I do it in heaven. So I give you that ram to dominate. I want you to do it. I want it to be a mere reflection. But we know that with that grace, with that grace to dominate and to rule he also gave him a free will to choose and that thing was dangerous to God it was dangerous to men we found that it was really dangerous because they made a dangerous fatal decision the Bible says that God told them not to do something and they did it anyway and as a result mankind not just Adam and Eve but mankind fell into human depravity and we know that that caused there to be so many things to happen. God, he is not in control of every single thing that we do. He wasn't then, and he's not now. Amen? We have the opportunity to make choices. The, 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 the fact that you tell God no often is foolproof that he's not controlling you. Amen. There are people that say, no, God, you're not supposed to say no, Lord. That's that's an oxymoron. It's supposed to be. Yes, Lord. How can you say no, Lord? As soon as you say no, Lord, you reveal the fact that he's truly not Lord in your life. When you say no, Lord, you're supposed to only say somebody say, yes, Lord. He wants you to say, yes, Lord. He wants to influence you. He wants to lead you by his spirit. But you have to choose to listen to him. It's a choice. It's free will. It's a free choice. Because of this free will, sin now exists. Because of this free will, evil now exists. Because of the result of evil and sin, the earth is still under a curse. Therefore, calamity does exist and hurricanes and earthquakes do exist and epidemics exist and pandemics exist. Yet none of this makes him no less God and makes him no less sovereign. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. The consolation is, though, that. He promises that one day there will be no more sickness. There will be no more disease. There, we will have a new body and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all things will be restored. Somebody shout hallelujah for that. But this is critical and this is the reason why we need to preach the gospel that people will find their way back to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ, back to walking with him, back to a close relationship with him like they were designed to do. 
God wants them to live the best life now and to have eternal security. And God has made a way for that through his son, Jesus Christ. We can be reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And God wants to restore all things. And he has began with you and I. We are part of the restoration of all things. Hallelujah. We made a choice one day to call upon the name of the Lord and we were saved. And so we have been restored in a place with God in the place with God. And we want the whole world to be restored to the rightful place with God to be in right standing to receive righteousness and justification just as we have so that they can experience the best in this life and in the life to come. Let's give him praise for that. So it is our human responsibility to make this choice. You and I made a right choice by accepting the Lord. We all have that before us. We have the power to choose. We can choose life. We can choose death. We can choose blessings. We can choose cursing. We can choose righteousness. We can choose evil. But it is a choice. It is a human responsibility. That brings me to this here, this point, and this is where we're going to take off today. And, you know, because there is a particular doctrine called deism. It's a academia term. It's a theological doctrine that says that God, he created everything. But then God set it in motion and let it be and say, go for it. In other words, he created it all. He got the ball rolling and he said, you're fin for yourself. There is an idea that that's how the world is working, that God just set it in motion. Yes, they acknowledge him as the creator. But God says, hey, you're on your own from here. And that's the reason they say it's all that's going on in the world. So they're saying the reason why they can explain why there's evil going on in the world because God took his hands off. He set it in motion and now we're left to our own devices. Yeah, now there is a thing also that's the opposite of that called theism. Now theism, it is different. It is in direct contrast to deism, it is the belief in the existence of God, especially belief in one God as the creator of the universe. Yeah. Intervening in it and sustaining a personal relation to his creatures or creatures. I say creation or creatures. In other words, theism says that God is involved. He sustained us he's sustaining the world and he has a intimate personal relationship with his creation his creatures now we know that the scripture says in Romans uh -huh. Romans 8 it says that they that have not the spirit of Christ is none of his yes. now we know that to be a truth we know that to be a truth in the kingdom of God but everybody might not know that to be a true. But the Bible says that they that have not the spirit of Christ, meaning have not entered into a relationship with Christ, is none of his. Meaning that they may be gods in relation to his creation, but they're not God in relation to his relationship with people. In other words, they're God's creatures but they're not God's sons and daughters. And so, in, so we have to understand that this providence thing and this, this providence thing, it has to deal with God and his own. It has to do with God and those that are called according to his purpose. It has to do with God and those who have enrolled in the providence plan. Now, there is a thing called special providence where God operates in every person's life to bring them to a place of relationship with him. See, God works on you even before you ever think about him. 
See, we got to know that, that, that God, he is good. I'm not saying that God doesn't care about those that are not his own. He just makes special provision for those that are his own because God has a say in their life because they have yielded and said yes to him. And they are not saying no, Lord, but they're saying yes. And so they give God opportunity and space to work in their lives, unlike somebody who is not a believer. But God is yet working on them to bring them to a place where he can have this entrance and this free course in their life. But it works. It works like this. And let me let me share a little bit more about it. Somebody say divine providence. You see, the scripture is full with providence. It's full with providence. I mean, providence is through and through in the scripture. I mean, you just you just run the record. Deism can't be. It can't be the doctrine that we're to live by because the Bible refutes it. It says in Proverbs 16, verse nine, a man's heart devises his way. Or we can make our plans, another translation says, but the Lord directed his steps. Psalms 37 verse 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. It's saying a good man or a righteous man, a just man, the steps of a good man, righteous man, meaning that he has some responsibility in that. And God says his steps, if he's a righteous or a just man, he says that he directed his steps it doesn't say that he direct everybody's steps but he says he he directs a just man's step i'm talking about providence because when we get into the providential will of god god says i get in on the matter and i start helping you out and i start directing things for you so that you don't have to experience certain things god said i'll open doors for you i'll shut doors i'll make ways that you cannot see on your behalf why because you are a just man now the only way we can be just is through the lord jesus christ because we can't make ourselves righteous if we had to look at our righteousness apart from the lord jesus christ we would be in sad shape y'all know what i'm talking about because you know yourself you had to realize i know we came up through religion and we came up through church and they told us that we had to do all the right things and that's what made us righteous and so we thought that we were righteous by our works and we were going to hell one day and going to heaven the next and going to hell the next day and going to heaven the next and then we had to realize by doctrine that we could never save ourselves that we were inept in the ability to save ourselves and we needed somebody to do for what uh, for us what we could not do for ourselves grace had to come in God's riches at Christ's expense thank God for the grace of God that saved the wretch like me I was once lost but now I'm found I was once blind but now I can see let the weak say I'm strong let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us it's not because we good some people are still talking about well I'm a good guy I'm a good person I'm a good this I'm a good that but why by what standard are you judging that by most people when they say that they're saying I'm not a criminal that's basically what they're saying I don't have a record but you, know, but, but, you know, but that's the truth. The truth about the matter is that we're not that good. Even the best of us, we're not that good. Because you think about the things that are in your heart, the things that you contemplate doing, the things that you do that nobody knows that you do. We are not that good. But thanks be unto God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we stop looking at folks funny. And we start living by how we, we start now looking at people by how we actually live, not by how we purport to live. And there's a whole difference when you look at people according to how you really live as opposed to how you purport to live. You didn't see me do it. Don't mean that I didn't do it. Can the church say amen? So we think if you didn't see me do it, that means I didn't do it. No, th that's why we, we serve the Lord and we try to please him because he's El Roy. He's the God that sees, he knows, and he knows all of that about you. And yet he still loves you. 
My God, he knows all that about you. Yeah, he still loves. He knows we jacked up. He still loves us. He knows that we're jacked up. He's still using us. He knows we're jacked up and he's still blessing us. And you think that is because of your goodness? I know we talk about the favor of God. I know we step into some principles, but God is better to us than we have been to ourselves. He does better for us than we even deserve. And so we thank God for his grace and we thank him for his mercy. His grace is given giving us what we do not deserve and his mercy not giving us what we do deserve come on let's give the Lord a praise in this place the Bible speaks of this providence thing it says this to trust the Lord with all your heart lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him somebody say acknowledge him that's the caveat acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths so that's saying hey you got to do something there's a human responsibility you got to acknowledge him for him to direct your path he said if you don't acknowledge me i can't get in your i can't get your attention enough to direct your path I can't get your attention. If you don't acknowledge me, I can't even give you the cue to go left. I cannot give you the instructions to go right. So he says there's human responsibility. God, divine providence, but God works it with human responsibility. Letting you know you play a part, I play a part. Now I'm going to do my part and I'm going to play my part well. I will not miss a beat. I will not miss a step. God will do it infallibly. Your purpose, your destiny will unfold based upon how you participate with God's providence. You are where you are and where you're not, how you have participated up to this point with God's providence, with his will and his plan for your life. It will be on track or off track based upon what you do. God says the, the promise is still good. You just need to get with the program. I, I've already designed for you to be blessed. I set it up for you. I've already teed it up for you. You just got to hit it out there. You got to know that God is working on our behalf. Now, the scripture says this, and we know, Romans 28. Somebody say that's confidence. See, mature Christians, we have confidence. Let me get my towel up here. We have confidence. We know, and for we know that all things... Somebody say all things work together, work together. That means he's orchestrating something, meaning that they didn't necessarily go together. He just worked them together. It's God working things together, things that don't fit. God said, I have a way of working them together. They didn't go together. I work them together for who? For the good of them. Them that love God. You got to understand them that love God. God's saying there's human responsibility. You love God. You know, I know we just want to get saved and then we want to tip through the tulips and let God do everything. God says, no, I know I declared you to be righteous, but that don't mean you ain't got to do nothing no more. Because you're talking about purpose and destiny. You know, it ain't just about fire insurance. It's not just about not going to hell. You see, in, uh, in church, we were just concerned about whether we were going to heaven or hell. We were not concerned about purpose and destiny. We were not concerned about living our lives in agreement with God's will and his divine providence. We were not thinking about kingdom. We were thinking about church. We were thinking of how we can go up the hierarchy in church and have church. And this is just a rehearsal. When we get to heaven, we're going to really sing. Now, we're not going to have joy down here. We're going to wait till the sweet by and by. And that's when we're going to get our blessing. So let's be burnt, busted, and disgusted in this life. And we're going to make it to the heaven. Make it into heaven. We just going to make it into heaven. Everything was making it. And God says, no, the truth about the matter is as soon as you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you pass from death to life. You already in there. You pass from death. Not you going to pass. No, you pass from you are translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. 
right in that moment, in that instance, you move from one camp to another camp. You move from darkness to light. You move from the world into the kingdom of God. You change even families. You change families. He changes your name, calls you righteous. Changes your nature since he changed my nature. Call me righteous. I'm not the same. So that's the truth. You are different. But he says, listen here, because of that, you're my own. I'm not going to bring you in my family and not take care of you. But I got special, special grace for you, special providence, special plans for you. I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end, to give you a hope and a future. Can the church say amen? So we know that he working this stuff together for our good, for them that a call them that love God called according to his purpose. So he doesn't cause all things. He doesn't direct all things, but he does plan in accordance. Somebody say he planned in accordance. <laughs> you know, when things happen, you know, you might have you might have had one plan. But when things happen, you plan in accordance. But the thing about it is this is the awesome thing about God is that God has the privilege of omniscience. So he's taking into account everything. You see what I'm saying? And so now he's working things together according to everything. Listen, that's why we have to understand that God even answers prayers providentially. See, I, if you ask me a favor, I might do the favor for you based upon what I think in the moment. Now, if five days from now, I might have said, well, I would have did that different being that I know what I know now. But God has the privilege of omniscience. So sometimes we pray and God said, you think you want that, don't you? But if you gave yourself 10 days, you would have a different. But he has the privilege of omniscience. So God says, I work it and I answer it providentially based upon the span of your life. I know what that's going to do to you and for you and what it's not going to do for you. And so you mad about it and you throwing a hissy fit thinking God didn't answer your prayer. And God said, I'll help you out. You ought to be giving me some praise. You think that I didn't do something for you. And God said, I was keeping you from some stuff because I know the second and the third order of effect of that thing. And I've taken into account your whole life. And you talking about to this week. God says, I got your whole life in mind. I got your whole life in mind and you talking about this week and you in your field. God says, I'm looking out for you because I know your end from your beginning. I know your end from your beginning. God finishes a thing, come back to the beginning and then lets you go through it. Let you take you through it. And that's how we have to understand this thing called divine providence. Somebody say preach preacher. Listen to this. Let, let me explain it. So I got to do this, you know, because we know that God told Jeremiah, he said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. He said, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, out of the womb I sanctified thee and ordained thee to be a prophet. And God not only did that, but then God saw him prophesy. You see? See, not only did he ordain him, sanctify him, but God saw him prophesy. God saw his prophecy come true. You see what I'm saying? You got to understand this is way bigger than what we think. Sometimes we think it's so finite. But if God has already written revelation, he know the end of the story. And we acknowledge him as the creator at the beginning. Don't you know he know everything in between? So that's why I say, Father, you know best. If I don't get something from God, I say, well, it must be something better. God's got something better for me because I know he has thoughts of good and not of evil towards me. Thoughts to give me a hope in the future. So if I don't have it, I say, well, God doesn't want me to have it. If I did my part, if I did not shirk my responsibility, I was in a place of prayer. I did what I was supposed to do. Some people want God to do everything. No, the reason you don't have it is because you didn't do your part. But once you do your part, you've saved yourself. You've been doing the right things. You've been. Y'all understand what I'm saying. Can the church say amen? amen? All right. Bless the name of the Lord. Let me go back to my notes now. 
Let, 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 me, let me give you the definition. The word providence comes from the Latin word providentia. Somebody say providentia. providentia. The Greek word pronoia. Pronoia. And means essentially foresight or making provision beforehand. Y'all have heard me say that before. That God has foresight or the word providence is foresight or making provision beforehand. Now, we have foresight, right? You and I, we have foresight. We know that in December, December 25th, every year it's going to be Christmas. Some people start in September because they have foresight. They know Christmas is coming and children are going to want gifts. So they get them early. They make provision beforehand. Now, the children don't know they got the gifts. You put them up for them. But they got them. It's just, it's, it's theirs. They got them. They just don't know. So you made provision beforehand. So when Christmas comes, all you have to do is bring out the gift. Now, you bought it in September. But you gave the gift in December. They had their name on it in September. Start up for you out of your sight. You could not see it. But he made provision beforehand. If you could just get a glimpse of what God has already done, you'll, you'll just put up the pity part and you'll just start praising him because you say, man, ain't God good. You see, because if you knew like God knew, you would be a different way. You would praise him. That's why sometimes you just got to take off and you just got to go ahead and give him praise in advance because, you know, when you get mature, you say, God, you know what? I have experience with you. Now, this situation, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I've seen you in the past. I know what you can do. So, God, I'm going to give you praise in advance for what you're going to do in my future, even though I can't see it now. I have now enjoyment for a future moment in my right now because why? I just got hope in my soul. I got Hope in my soul for what God will do in my life. Why? Because I'm on the providence plan, baby. So I know he's working some things on my behalf. Can the church say amen? Now, 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 now let, me, let, let me take a little more time. I have about five to seven more minutes. Can I have five to seven more minutes? Now, now this is the thing we have to understand. That, that if you look at um, Apple, Apple has great foresight. Apple has great foresight. The reason why Apple is doing so well because they can see. They plan for the future. They're already working on something right now that we can't see. They're working on that in the background. You know, they are already ahead. Somebody say ahead. They're, they're thinking about 2025 and 2030. And now when people get to 25, they're trying to now come up with stuff that Apple has already been planning in 2020. And so they're ahead. By the time we get there, we're enjoying what they have already put in the work that they already have put in on that thing and so now they're able to stay on the cutting edge and while people are trying to catch up they don't realize that they're working overtime to stay ahead well God somebody say always stays ahead now when you look at Kmart the reason why Kmart no longer exists because they didn't have foresight Used to be Kmart was everything. And nobody could have told you 15, 20 years ago that Kmart would be none of null and void. Are they gone? They completely gone. The giant Kmart is completely gone because they didn't have foresight. And I remember some years ago I walked in there. I said, this ain't going to last because you go in there and the lights were dim. And the shells wasn't, were bare and the thing looked like 20, 30 years ago. But then you go into Target and you go into Walmart and everything is vibrant and everything. And you know that it has missed its time. Why? Because somebody didn't have foresight. Well, God, he is a foresight kind of God. You see, these people, they have foresight with limited knowledge. Foresight, somebody say with limited knowledge. Now, when applied to God, the idea takes on a vastly larger dimension because God not only looks ahead and attempts to make provision, meaning that they're trying to see. Apple is trying to see what people are going to like five for you. So they make attempts to it. Sometimes they hit the mark. Sometimes they miss. Every product does not sell the same. Sometimes they hit it. Sometimes they miss it because they have foresight 
with limited knowledge. But God, he not only attempts to make provision for his goal, but he infallibly, without fail, accomplishes what he sets out to do. See, see, when God don't try to do nothing, he don't try to do nothing. God does it. Somebody say God does it. Now, now we have to understand that providence then is the sovereign, divine superintendence of all things, everything under the watchful eye of God, guiding us toward our divinely predetermined end, purpose, and destiny in a way that is consistent with our creative nature. He know what he put in within you, and God is working on you and working with you to get what he put within you out of you. He's guiding you to that predetermined determined in that pre purpose and destiny God said I put a whole lot in you so it's going to be a lot more that you're going to have to deal with because much is given much is required you wonder why you go through the things that you go through it's because of what you're working with everybody don't have to go through what you go through but you have to go through because of what you're working with God he deals to every man the measure of faith it didn't say he gives them the same measure he gives you the measure of faith according to your gifts your callings and your purpose how big the job is he has for you how big is the job that he has for you? If it's, if it's local, God gives you a local anointing. But it's national, God gives you a national anointing. And that the, the things that you're going to go through is going to be in proportion to what God is trying to get out of you. But if you're at the local level and you should be at the national level, you have missed the mark and you have not participated with his providence for your life. You're going to be frustrated. And you're going to be saying, this is not it. This is not it. That's greater. I'm appreciative for where I am, but this is not it. Now, I'm not indicating anything about myself. I'm just preaching the word. Can the church say amen? amen. Let's give them a praise in the house today. God, I'm very, 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 very fulfilled in what I do and, and pastoring this church. Praise the name of the Lord and speaking even through this airways. We're expanding our reach. Amen. Expanding our reach, establishing kingdom minded people. Am I talking right this this morning? It's this afternoon. It's this afternoon. Amen. So let me let me do this because I, I intended to be much further than where I am. This is what the word of God would share with us. Um, even as I let me let me do a little bit more. Uh, work on this, and then I'm going to take you to the scriptures, I think. Oh, uh, my, 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 my. Somebody said in here, take your time. Somebody said, take your time. I got time. I hope that you feel the same way there in your living room. I got time. L listen to this. Listen to this. L listen to this. I think this is good. We might have to finish up on this. Providence. Listen to this is the activity of God as accomplished through law. Now, 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 this is going to mess with you. This was a revelation to me, and when I understood it, I said, okay, I got it, God. It stands in contrast to the miraculous. Now, I was just typing this out as the Holy Spirit was giving it, by which the Lord operates independent of law. I got to say all that together. Providence is the activity of God as accomplished through law. It stands in contrast to the miraculous by which the Lord operates independent of law. See, God manipulates his own laws for the accomplishment of his ultimate purpose. Now, he works within a certain framework. But when he wants to get some accomplished, he will operate independent of law and allow Peter to walk on water. You see? Now, that's the miraculous. That's supernatural where God operates in the you're not supposed to walk on water, but I got a purpose to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to operate independent of law and do something for a purpose that all might believe. That all might believe that all might know the power of God. Now, I ain't got to do that every time. And in fact, I don't do it every time. I do it through my own counsel of my own will when I get ready because I do whatever I wish because I'm what? Sovereign. 
You can't pray and make God perform a miracle. You know, you can ask. You can trust. You can wait. But you can't order it. People claim that they can order it. You know, that, that it's, it's a sad thing where, 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 where we sometimes we overstep our bounds and we say that we can do things or cause things that we don't have the power or the ability to do or didn't have permission from God to do. You know, you don't, you don't tell people that you can pray over COVID and people will be healed and then die from it for yourself. You've overstepped. God can heal. God can deliver. God can. But if God didn't tell you and didn't give you that grace and didn't tell you to lay hands, then you have overstepped. I don't care that you're anointed. You're not anointed for that. Oh, man. So that's why I'm careful. You know, everybody wants you to be prophetic. Everybody wants you to operate in the gift. They want their pastor to be flowing and dripping with the anointing. But I have to abide in what I'm called to do. If God told me to teach, I'm going to teach it till I can't teach it no more. And if you want prophecy, you better find somebody to give you a word or you can wait on God to drop a prophetic word on the teacher to give to you. But people are searching and hopping right because they want to experience the supernatural. And everything that's deemed to be supernatural, people call supernatural, ain't necessarily supernatural. There are people that are out there that figure out how to do the thing. What do the thing? Create the atmosphere to where you think something happening, nothing happening. Ain't nobody getting healed, nobody getting delivered, but they saying that they are. I know I want a real authentic, so if I open up my mind and say, God, and, and, and tell you to come, God has given me an unction to function, and I'm going to stand in the power and the authority of God in that moment to do what God will have me to do, and God will do the work. God will do the work. God will speak the word. God will bring about the healing and the miracles and the deliverance but what I'm talking about I, I just that's just a side note what I'm talking about is this what I'm talking about is this is that supernatural we're after supernatural somebody say we're after supernatural but most of what we are going to experience most of what we're going to experience is providence see Listen, listen, most of what we're going to experience is providence. What I mean by that is that, see, supernatural miracles, healings, independent of law. What well, God has to manipulate something, right? This, are, this is supernatural. But providence is when God, he works on a thing within law within the defines of law okay. like you didn't have to he didn't have to manipulate law to work it on your behalf it took longer but he got it done through providence it feels supernatural but it really was providence how many ever stepped into something and you say, you know what? I see the hand of God in this here. How that God worked this and he worked that. And you see the trail. You can run the record. You can run the trail. And when you get to your blessing, when you get that, that job that you got, you know, you, you, you can run the record and see how that God positioned you and brought this person in your life and that person in your life. That's the hand of God. That's God's supernatural hand working in your life. But God is working through the law. See, what we want to do, we want God to just do like this and just zap us with everything and get a miracle and change everything. But God does that of his own sovereign will. Most of what we see in this dispensation because in some dispensation God would do more miracles supernatural but in this dispensation God says the just shall live by faith not living by miracles not just walking around chasing somebody that, who's giving uh, five loads two fishes and five loads of bread and making that five thousand no God says the just shall live by faith so in this dispensation God wants us to live by faith and he wants us to follow this providence plan to where he's working things on our behalf 
in law, not independent of law. He sometimes will step over independent of law to work something out, but you got to be working with a purpose for him to do so. You understand? Because he does all things purposeful. Let me explain this, and I'm going to be done because I really can preach for another hour. I really can right now. But can I share a story? Now, uh, and y'all say, well, Pastor, it wasn't as deep to me as you said. But once you get the revelation of it, I'm telling you, it's going to be deep. And you're going to stop chasing around behind people for, to get a miracle and get this word and get that word. And you'll start letting God do what he's doing in your life and find out that's supernatural in itself. That's divine in itself. And it's so good. You, 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 you start now operating by faith rather than signs are for an unbeliever. Signs are for an unbeliever. That's why God is not doing so many different things in your life. Early on in your life, you'll find that God will do little things in your life to just mesmerize you. But as you get older, God still does it. He just does it in a more masterful way. And oftentimes you can't see it until you see it in hindsight. And you say, ain't he bad? Ain't he? And God wove, wove together some things in the tapestry of your life and work some things together for your good. I remember when I was getting ready to get out of the military. This is an example. In 2003, Key, 2003, I decided after 10 and a half years in the Army that I was going to get out. It was a gut-wrenching decision because you don't get out after 10 years. You only got 10 more to go. Nine and a half more to go, then you can get that retirement at 37. 37. Man, you know how good that sounds. You're telling me I need to get out, but God, God had encouraged me, admonished me, even got counsel from, from the pastor that I was under at the time to get out of the military. Turned down an assignment to go recruiting. I was supposed to go to, I was supposed to go to Tampa. I shut that down. I said, no. Then they put me on assignment to go to Fort Knox. Both of those things would have taken me out of here, and I wouldn't be here right now. Both of those things. I made the choice to get out. So once I declined that, I got out, and I was like, I was messed up, though, a little bit because, God, I believe that I'm following you, but it seems to me that I'm about to hit this poverty streak in my life because I ain't got no job. Now, somebody told me that I was supposed to get a job. I was supposed to work for a church. But it didn't materialize. And here I am giving up my career and getting ready to get out of the army. And I don't have a job. Now, I started a lawn care business, but it wasn't hardly making anything. We didn't have but two or three yards. Can the church say amen? amen. But here I am following God directing my steps because I said yes to the Lord. Sub submitted my will. To his. I said yes to the Lord. It was a decision that everybody thought was crazy around me. I made the decision. I was getting out on January the 10th, 2003. Hopefully you ain't turned me off yet. I called my reserve unit on January the 10th, 2003 to tell them, hey, I'm coming over to 2174 Garrison Support Unit. I just wanted to call and see what my instructions are. This is my last day. This is my ETS today. I need instructions. Oh, Sergeant Wells, I'm so glad you called. Listen here. I made a decision to get out. Don't have a job. Trusting this, even trusting the man's word and this and that. <clears throat> but listen to this. She says, you work in the chapel. Yeah, yes, ma'am, I work in the chapel. Oh, she said, that's wonderful. She said, you still have your desk there? Yeah, I got my desk, you know. They ain't cleaned it out yet. I mean, I cleaned out some stuff, but it's still there. She said, you going back to that desk. She said, um, they just mobilized our unit, and so you just go, you just go ahead and stay at the chapel there, and then uh, we'll just go through the process, the in-processing you, because we're already mobilized. So I stay in the same job, getting the same money, unbeknownst to me, God allowed me to stay on active duty for another two years while we were preparing to start the ministry. I stayed on active duty from 2003 to 2005. September September 2005 is when we started Living Waters Christian Fellowship. That's now Kingdom Life Christian Church. 
But it was why? Why? That was providence. I had no idea that I would be on active duty in the reserve. I thought I would be drilling. I thought I would be getting a paycheck for one weekend a month. But when I saw that, I realized that, hey, God, you much bigger than me. How could that happen like that? Because God made provision beforehand. 